Greetings and welcome to the uh, final uh, lecture uh, for the entire course here, uh, which is a pretty remarkable feat uh, for me because I've put together a lot of these things and I've, I've enjoyed every minute of it uh, based on all the material I've covered. <clears throat> and I'm really happy uh, to end the last few lectures uh, looking at some fiction. Uh, one of my favorite short storyists, Sherwood Anderson, uh, who I think touches upon a lot of pressing themes that in, in some way or another really connects to a lot of the material and a lot of the ideas that we've talked about throughout the course of the semester. Um, you know, especially that notion of bringing dignity uh, to people's lives where, where it may have been lost. So we, the last story that we'll be working with here, uh, that I'll be uh, doing a lecture on here is Death, toward the end of the uh, novel, and this occurs on page 135 is where it starts. One thing that's interesting about this short story, remember that, and, and many authors do this, uh, Sherwood Anderson has created this fictional town of Winesburg, Ohio. And he has populated this with all kinds of characters with their own tragedies and their own kind of conflicts taking place. As we know, the one person who's always kind of involved one way or the other is George Willard. Um, and as we saw in the last story, The Strength of God, the main characters of these particular short stories seem to come to him after this cathartic moment, after they've had some major revelation or realization, and they share it with him. And then it's all about him as a reporter who is this kind of objective um, surveyor of the world, or at least his town, <clears throat> but he comes to have an objective understanding. At least we as readers through George have a subjective understanding of these people uh, that we uh, experience in these stories. So it's fitting for some of these stories, death being one of these stories, where we are focused on his family, George. And while George is not the protagonist of this piece, we know he has a special place in it, his mother Elizabeth is. And this is all about Elizabeth. Uh, and her journey, uh, especially as far as her married life is concerned, married life. So I'll start by just, and I've done extensive note taking um, to prepare for this lecture. So we may read, but I've kind of quoted material here in my notes, so that might suffice. But if we start with some kind of themes that might be important to us uh, as we look at this text, um, I think one of the issues that Sherwood Anderson as an author, as a modernist author writing uh, during, you know, the 1920s, uh, uh, that era, is this idea of the American dream, how it is integral to who we are as a people and as individuals. However, if the American dream is kind of coercive, if it's forced, and if people feel compelled or forced into it, how successful can the American dream really be? I've mentioned probably here or there in some of these lectures, the whole idea is that the American dream, one of the, problem at, one of the problems with the American dream is that people try to shove themselves into it um, and it doesn't work for them no matter what effort they put into it. Uh, no, ma no matter what back-breaking labor they put into it, no matter, and here's the devastating part, no matter how, many, how, m how much they change their character, they change who they are, they don't fit into this American dream, right? Uh, and it ends up being much more disadvantageous than advantageous, right? It ends up being a very disadvantaging uh, kind of uh, process. And I think when we're centered in on the American dream for Elizabeth uh, Willard, we're talking about this idea of marriage. And one thing that sticks out like a sore, unfortunate thumb in the story is that she is not happy in her marriage to Tom Willard. And that's what we're exploring in the story, right? Marriage sometimes for some people, uh, probably even more so in this day and age when, you know, uh, again, women didn't necessarily provide for themselves. Uh, they didn't have the opportunities they may have today where you can be a single successful woman and run your own show, right? And live your own life without the worry of a man there to take care of you, right? Um, 
So one of the problems that can come from this idea of marriage is it can feel like more of a business arrangement uh, than a relationship of passion and adventure, right? And maybe this doesn't dawn on a woman or a man, here we're focused on a woman, maybe this doesn't dawn on a woman until she is well into the marriage where she wakes up one day or starts to remember how life used to be and, and realizes there's no passion, there's no adventure here. I don't feel young anymore. Uh, this feels more like a burden. This feels more like a necessity in the business arrangement sense. So something to keep in mind. And when a woman feels as if a marriage, especially in this time period, isn't working, what are her options is a question we have to keep in mind. What if there's children involved? That seems to constrict options or restrict options even more. If there are children involved, which in their case there is, there is George. Another question I think we can kind of get into here based on this story death. Does a human being deserve to be happy? satisfied or is happiness just a bonus to life but not a requirement to life right if you're happy and you're satisfied hey man you, you've kind of hit the jackpot right but it but it's not a it's not a, a, a necessity your happiness is not a necessity right if it happens that's great if it doesn't um, life goes on right um, there is always now now one thing we'll, we'll, we'll talk about early on here is we'll look at the symbolism of God within this piece and I think if you're reading very carefully and very sensitively um, you'll see that there's a very clear God presence within this piece and we can get into that um, but let me say a couple things about the love of God um, based on what I gather from the story not based on my own life based on what I'm gathering from this story. <clears throat> Excuse me. There is always the love of God. If there's no love in your marriage or no, or no love in your family or perhaps not even any love in your community, wherever, there is always the love of God, which may be a translation of a less expected love, right? So the love of God might actually translate into a love as far as an individual is concerned in a very different way. Through the love of God, you can come to love something in your own life tremendously. And I think when we talk about Elizabeth Willard, we're talking about a love for intimacy, for passion, for youthfulness, knowing that these are all essentially synonymous with youth and adventure. That's what she has a love for. And God, through a confession and admittance and an honesty on behalf of the individual can sanctify and uphold the love that we as individuals as individuals are after potentially that love of intimacy passion and adventure uh, we're going to get into it now um, sorry if you hear some air conditioning uh, the units close by um, this is a very haunting story and I think another thing we have to be aware of is it's, it's also a very, it's a cautionary tale, right? Through, just writing that down, um, through the exploration of Elizabeth War, uh, Willard's life, we come to learn a lesson about how we should perceive our own lives or at least within the context of the story, staying within the boundaries of the story, we get a sense of what George should keep in mind as a young man on the verge of a long life ahead of him, right? Let's learn from Elizabeth Warren here, right? Um, here we go, death. And like I said, I prepared extensive notes here, uh, which is always useful because um, I always use these notes in my uh, traditional class in the classroom as well, so these always come uh, very much in handy. So, Dr. Reefy's office is um, very much described in the beginning of the story as kind of the, the final walkway to death, right? Uh, it's a stairway, it's a sta it is described as a stairwell that many have traveled before. And if you start to match this up, another stairwell that many have traveled before is this path to death, right? Uh, as I've probably mentioned before, it is the great 
human common denominator, right? No matter how beautiful you are, rich you are, no matter how poor you are, uh, feelings of unattractiveness, whatever, death is there for all of us in the end. And it's all about how you approach death. Reminds me of like Hemingway always dealt with that. Do you approach, do you confront death like a, a, a brave individual or as, as a coward? It's one of the themes he always kind of uh, plays upon. But moving up to Dr. Reefy's office is described as, as, as moving closer and closer to death, the end of your life. Now when you get up to the top of the stairwell, to the right is the doctor's office. To the left, a pile of rubbish. Now that helps us very clearly put it in, into perspective. There's a major contrast there, right? If I take a right at the top of the stairway as I'm getting closer to death, going up these stairs, if I take a right, it's Dr. Reefy's office. If I take a left, it's a trash bin. Who in the world would want to end up in a trash bin? So I think if we're starting to kind of investigate this, we want to go right. We want to go into Dr. Reefy's office, right? There's some positivity here. I'll be very general early on. There's some positivity if we take a right and go into Dr. Reefy's office, right? So keep that in mind. So to the left, there's this pile of rubbish for useless items. Um, and what could we categorize or understand as useless by the end of this story, right? We know that Elizabeth goes right. She goes into Dr. Reefy's office and she spends a lot of quality time there. We'll discuss that. But to the left, that's where uselessness goes. That's where useless items, perhaps a useless life, that's where it goes, to the left, right? Onto the trash heap. Now, I think it's probably worth mentioning here early on, because this will help you frame the story. And there's good evidence of this throughout, especially in, and even in the beginning. Dr. Reefy, let me just give you some of the uh, detail here. No gray beard yet. It's described as he doesn't have a gray beard yet. He is not a graceful man yet. He is, has this problem of trying to figure out how to dispose of his hands and his feet. And I don't know what that means even on a literal level, but on a figurative level, to, or maybe even on a literal level, to dispose of your hands and feet means to get away from some idea of being a human being here on Earth, right? That's what makes us human beings within the earthly realm here is the hands, right? And the bodies that we have here. No gray beard yet. Not a graceful man yet. Worried about ridding himself of these things that make us human. I think what you have here is a very clear representation of God. You'll see how this makes sense as we move through the story here, but just keep that locked away in your brain. We're talking about God. Now the stairwell already makes sense, right? When you go up to the top of the stairs and, and get closer and closer to death, to the right is God, to the left is a useless trash pile, right? Where we throw things of no interest or uselessness. Um, and if you take a right, Dr. Reefy's office, it's God, right? That's what we're talking about here. Moving on, page 136. Um, in literature, and that's what we're reading here, and if you go on to take the literature class at Moore Park or at other colleges, this is something you have to get used to doing when dealing with fiction. You have to look up names because they're all of your names. Everyone's name right now. Everyone's, you know, and I think about the names of all the individuals in my class. Your name has a particular symbolism to it. It means something. And you can look this up very easily on Google and you can find some sources that are available. Elizabeth. Let's, let's translate Elizabeth's name. It stands for, my God is an oath. So really it stands for this oath in God, right? That's what Elizabeth translates as. Another translation of Elizabeth is, my God is abundance, right? Um, my God is an oath. My God is abundance. Now, what does abundance mean? I'm not too sure. But even in the general sense, this idea of having things, and I don't think we mean treasures and wealth and material items. Abundance as far as love in your life goes, those kinds of uh, features, right? Abundance, my God is abundance. Now we know that Dr. Reefy is essentially a psychiatrist or a psychologist. And it's a perfect idea for what God is. God in many people's lives and Elizabeth's life, right? 
in the figurative sense, is essentially a psychiatrist and a psychologist. It's someone you go to and confess your issues to, how you're really feeling. It's the psychologist and the psychi uh, psychiatrist who perhaps know your secrets more than people that you associate with in life, even your own friends and family, right? Because they are this special person that you can give those ideas to, uh, potentially even without judgment, right? Um, or, or a different form of judgment could be. Um, Dr. Reefy, I'm not going to read the language, but it's in my notes here, is also kind of described as a poet. Uh, now we're getting back to the subjectivism uh, that we dealt with in hands. Remember, subjective versus subjective. Um, prayer is necessary, but at the same time, no words are necessary. Uh, and lastly, they have the similar belief in the same gods, which is kind of a strange... Uh, detail to their kind of connection, uh, but it does mention that they have the same. They have they have a similar uh, belief in the same gods here. Okay. All right. So moving on. Another thing that's kind of interesting here is uh, on the bottom. At some point, it's mentioned that he chuckles, like Elizabeth will start to discuss philosophy, right, philosophy. And God, or I should say Dr. Reefy chuckles at her discussions of philosophy. And, and that's interesting because when you think about philosophy, philosophy is man, mankind, trying to figure out the intricacies of the universe, our place in this universe, uh, especially with this special uh, human conscience, which no other animals uh, kind of possess, right? We have this consciousness in life that makes us incredibly rare. So philosophy is always mankind's attempts at figuring out the complexity of life and living. Whereas God is kind of the, you know, they oppose each other because the whole idea is that God is its own philosophy, right? God chuckles at mankind trying to figure out the way that life worth, works because God knows. And it's almost like philosophy is a little little play toy, right, uh, that you give to uh, human beings, right, because they're never really going to fully understand it. So let them, let them tinker with it. It's almost like you see a little kid messing with a Rubik's Cube, right, trying to figure it out. God chuckles at that in the sense that that is people trying to figure out some philosophy um, that answers all of the questions that simply can't be answered, right? That's what philosophy does. Um, and I'm not discounting philosophy, I'm just putting it in context of what we have here. Uh, the woman, Elizabeth, inspires herself partially. We find out on page 137 kind of her main internal conflict, right? What, what kind of plagues her and what torments her. And she yearns to have adventure and passion in her life. She wants that back, passion and adventure, right? But Dr. Lee, uh, Reefy tells her, love is the divine accident of life. That real love, the kind of love she's after, it needs to happen as an accident. You can't force it. You can't manage it. You can't arrange it. Um, we're not going to talk about the concept of arranged marriages, but I can tell you this based on the content of this story and the social commentary that Sherwood Anderson is providing us, I don't think he'd be a strong advocate of arranged marriages at all because that is simply no accident. Dr. Reefy, in other words, God is saying love needs to be a divine accident, right? You can't and should not force it. And we get some nice poetic language on page 137 that describes this, right? And all of this harkens back to her mother. As she starts to think about this idea, you can't force love, she wants passion, she wants adventure, it makes her go back to her mother. And then as soon as she goes back to her mother, she goes back thinking about her father. 
and her father as we know is described as a pretty troubled man pretty despondent perhaps probably depressed clinically so and there's a lot of talk about his hotel and hence his career of the hotel it never leaves him alone here's an example that plays into the theme of Sherwood Anderson that sometimes we force ourselves into these businesses we force ourselves into these business operations that just don't feel good to us and they don't come out successful right and yet you still feel the need and the urge to put everything you have into it and it just doesn't work I've tech I've I've personally never known anyone who's had a, like a failed business venture I you might um, but somebody who just it, it drains them right and they put everything into it and then they get so knee-deep in it that they feel like they can't even give up right and they keep they keep giving it everything they got I personally never known someone who's lost it all like that right uh, or or been in such a miserable situation but these things do happen right so she goes back thinking about her mother and her father it sounds like her father is is quite the introvert I mean somebody who kind of keeps things to himself right uh, deals with his problems on his own and think about it hotel business is not a great business for somebody of an introverted nature right so it's a real horrible mismatch right it's a bad match up there for him um, and importantly it's the thought of his daughter in this environment that overcomes him with sadness I think you have to do a pretty good detailed analysis of the symbolism of a hotel right especially the symbolism of a hotel when this is not even the kind of business you wish you were into right and then we can translate this back to the idea of marriage which we know is a big problem for Elizabeth think about a hotel you know if you open up a hotel whether you want guests or not they're coming right whether you want visitors or not they're gonna be there right beyond that now they're there you don't want them there they're there now you gotta feed them now you got to talk to them now you got to entertain them and again if you've ever worked in the hospitality business you know that even if you're having a bad day you better shrug that aside and go about your business right uh, or it spells bad business right it's it's not good uh, business so forced guests un unwanted company that's exactly how Elizabeth feels in her marriage that she's essentially kind of forced to be with somebody right that there's a guest in her life unfortunately Tom the poor guy that she'd rather not be involved with right so I think there's some interesting symbolism as far as the hotel goes right now here's my question with all that in mind the thought of his daughter in this hotel environment and growing up in this hotel because they probably live in it right and, and, and kind of operate the business why do you think that the idea of his daughter growing up in this environment overcomes him with sadness why does the thought of her growing up in this environment sadden him that's one of the questions that most likely we will deal with in a conference uh, at the end of the week so you might want to start to get some ideas down make your life easier down the road he also as a detail to that seems to worry about her involvement with men and that would make sense he's not necessarily happy in his marriage we know that the mom doesn't sound happy we know that down the road a generation later Elizabeth's not happy in her marriage he's worried about her being involved with men because perhaps the next step is an unhappy marriage I think if I'm kind of taking that all the way through that's what we're left with moving on page 137 it's mentioned and it's it should be mentioned because it's important Elizabeth has had sexual and intimate experiences before Tom Willard so it says several several experiences right so it's not like Tom Willard was her first sexual experience um, and that was a first for her that'd be a whole different story who knows what this story would be if he was her first she's had many intimate sexual experiences before Tom so 
maybe that tells us that Tom is not giving her what she experienced before, right? He can't fulfill that same type of uh, intimacy and sexuality. Perhaps he's, it's just not there for Tom. And here's the thing, and this reminds me of a, another story I'm reading, uh, uh, Chan Xia, uh, one of the Chinese uh, literature books I teach at, in my AP class uh, at the high school. Um, if you've experienced a real passionate, uh, let's say, adventurous relationship before, you can't get that out of your brain, especially when you're in a relationship where it's completely lacking. It's always going to be this kind of longing uh, that you have. You can't just you know, force amnesia upon you uh, in order to forget about the real passion, the real adventure that you had at one point. That's her problem. She can't forget these things. Moving on. Um, she desires a real lover. And my question, another question I have for you is, what does that mean? What is she looking for? What do you think? And this is kind of just based on your own interpretation. If she desires a real lover, what does that mean? You can kind of think of that uh, for yourself. Moving on, we get into a, a kind of dose of realism. Realism is kind of reality, right? We, if you know anything about kind of literary genres, or at least kind of, let's say, phil philosophical outlooks, there's realism versus romanticism, right? Romanticism is the ideal, what could be, right? What, when you kind of use your imagination and you come up with these romantic uh, kind of uh, possibilities, right? Uh, the air conditioning's wonderful today. Uh, realism uh, is what really happens, right? You can see this in all of the romantic comedies that you watch when you go to the movie theater, right? Ideally, there's this kind of out-of-touch guy who's got all kinds of problems and flaws. Um, I don't have to articulate those problems and flaws, but they tend to be in short, a mess, losers, right? And yet, by the end of this romantic comedy, they got the hottest, most successful, most kind of down-to-earth girl you could get. The bottom line is, in reality, that doesn't happen, right? That doesn't happen. It's, it's kind of, it's romanticizing this kind of imaginative possibility, right? That's why those movies tend to work. They're taking the biggest loser and they're giving them the biggest catch. In reality, let's just be quite honest, it doesn't tend to play out that way, right? Um, but now we get some realism here. And on page 138 it says that Elizabeth marries Tom out of practicality, not out of desire. I think it comes down to timing, right? It's just a matter of really good timing. It says there on page 138, like she was just kind of like at that point where marriage sounded like a good idea. She opens up her eyes to this possibility. Tom's sitting right there, right? And it's kind of just really good timing. But it's not passion. It's not desire. It's not that sense of adventure. Uh, which means, I think according to the commentary by Anderson, if that's why you got together with somebody because of good timing and practicality and pragmatism, uh, that relationship is probably doomed from the start. Going back to what Dr. Reefy, aka God, says, you can't plan it, right? You can't force it. It has to desire and love just needs to happen all by itself. It can't be this kind of planned and practical thing. So that's a very realistic way of going about marriage, right? Is recognizing, well, you know, good timing. I'm getting a little bit old here. I better get this show on the road. Uh, this show on the road, right? Moving on. Um, she is obviously an outsider, uh, Elizabeth. I think it's 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 inferred, it's implied that she questions the necessity of marriage, which would be very much being an outsider at this time period, right? In the 1920s, early 1900s, where the expectation is if you're a woman, you need to get married, right? 
This is what Sherwood Anderson does. Go back to hands, go back to wing biddlebaum, right? Uh, go back to, in some respects, the strength of God with Reverend Hartman, right? These are unusual people in the sense that they don't conform to the expectations and norms of a society. And the feeling that they must conform to these expectations is what builds this internal conflict that kind of eats them alive, right? Um, moving on. It's also, to, to make matters worse, uh, the narrator talks about the debt and the collapse, collapse dream of Tom Willard. He works hard, but the hotel business is just not profitable, right? And I think there's a really important theme here, right? What is Tom concerned with? Repainting this hotel, improving the condition of the hotel, trying to make the damn business successful. That's what he's worried about. What is Elizabeth worried about? Getting back to some real passion and youthfulness and sense of adventure because the relationship that she is in, the marriage that she is in, is all but stale. Now notice how it's, it's never thought about. It's never a, a possibility or an option, but notice there could be a fix very easily uh, in mind here. If Tom said to hell with the business, said, screw it, screw it, I don't care about this hotel business, what's more important to me is my wife, and giving her that intimacy and that passion, maybe the marriage could have worked out. But this is a central theme to Sherwood Anderson's work. What's the priority in our lives? Work, business, economic success, not relationships, psychology, right? Um, and unfortunately, that's, that's the big difference here, right? If Tom just could have thought about it, and we can't speculate on that. That's me speculating, but you can't really write about that uh, because it's not provided for us, right? We can't say, oh, what if, what if Tom would have been this super romantic guy and really kind of put all of his efforts and uh, you know, thoughts on his wife. It doesn't happen that way, right? So we're left with this kind of tragedy. But don't forget the central theme here. Our business priorities kind of went out here. Our need to be successful the capacity we're working on. It could be any profession, right? Whether you be a nurse or a teacher or a small business uh, owner or a lawyer, etc. If that is what we dedicate our lives to, relationships will, will falter, right? Relationships will suffer because of that. It's a major theme that Anderson gives us. Another great story, it's not in this book, but another great story that I teach uh, from him is called The Egg. Beautiful story, and it kind of, it deals with the same theme there, right? Uh, moving on. I think because of the coercion to marry, this, she feels the need to marry. Um, she was coer um, I think because of this coercion to marry that Tom was coerced into this business. Now we do know that he inherits it from her father. It was a failure for her father, this business, this hotel business. It ends up being essentially a failure for Tom too. Which means that the symbolism of the hotel, and I talked about unwanted guests, right? Feeling this, this need to connect. I, you could go further with that, but the symbolism of the hotel is even heightened because it is both a failure for her father and a failure for uh, Tom. I'll just read this. He was coerced into this business, which he has failed, and it has failed him. And so, and then this is talking about Tom, her father. And so he wants his daughter to avoid marriage because in the process, she will avoid so much more, including financial tragedy. And so he gives her money. There's this $800, which we, we are, which is mentioned all the way up into the end of this story. He gives her this $800 and he says to her, this money is a great open door to you. And the next question you have, which we will surely deal with in the conference, what does the father mean by an open door? Why is this $800 that he gives to her earnestly and says it's a great open door to you? What does he mean by that when he says that? All right. 
right after the section break there, right after the section break on page uh, 138, we're back in Reefy, aka God's office, and Elizabeth is described as tired and gaunt. Gaunt meaning kind of pale and kind of lifeless. Um, notice that she is described exactly as her father, right? Her father was just described, Tom was just described in that way, and now she's described just like him, suffering the same fate, right? Suffering the same fate. We need to break this cycle. How are we going to break this cycle? Page 139, God as therapist. This is where you start to see that Rifi as therapist is essentially playing the role of God, right? Um, so, this is one of the, again, very, very haunting and sad story. She says, um, after my first night with Tom, and I think she means sexually. I'm pretty sure that's, that's what she's implying. After her, her first night with Tom sexually, she says, um, she found out on that first night. She says, I'm just reading at the top of 139. She says, and then I was married, and, and, and it did not turn out at all, she said bitterly. It didn't go good. As soon as I had gone into it, I began to be afraid. Perhaps I knew too much before, and then perhaps I found out too much during my first night with him. I don't remember. There's a juxtaposition taking place there, a contrast for us. She says, uh, perhaps I knew too much before. Before going into this marriage, I knew too much. And we already mentioned that, the passion, the real excitement, the real adventure, the real love, the real lust, whatever you want to call it, right? It was all there. And that is contrasted with, uh, and then perhaps I found out too much during my first night with him. In her first kind of sexual experience with Tom, she realized there was none of this, right? This just wasn't happening, right? So she found out a lot just in the first night. Imagine that. Imagine going into a marriage, the whole hoopla and ceremony and formality of it, and then you spend that first night with your husband and you realize there is no sexual oomph, right? There's just nothing there. That's got to be really rough, right? Even in the fictional sense, I can now think about that in the re reality, right? In the real sense, that must be very hard. Um, she says, she says, sadly, it wasn't Tom I wanted, it was marriage. And we need to provide a full interpretation of this line, right? So there's your next question. What does she mean by that? It wasn't Tom I wanted, it was marriage. And I think one of the problems I'm running into with some of the uh, responses I get on discussion questions is some of you are just not going deep enough in your responses, right? And this is the time to have a full, fully fledged response with all the detail needed to really explain. It wasn't Tom I wanted, it was marriage. What does she mean by that? Provide extensive detail, right? So you understand. All right. And I think, I think we're all thinking what that means. We would just have to get it down on paper. Okay, moving on. Sad again. There's kind of a lot of sadness going on in these pages here. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm still getting over a little something. <clears throat> she wanted to tell Tom. She wanted to tell Tom how she felt. But he was in the process of painting and fixing up the old hotel. And he's trying to fix up this hotel that he's essentially inherited from her father, right? He's trying to paint it. Now, we know that painting, we got to think about the symbolic nature of painting. If you're painting something, what that means is uh, you are just putting a cover on it. You're just putting a fresh coat on it, but it's not necessarily uh, fixing or getting rid of or repairing the real damage that lays underneath, right? So all he's trying to do is kind of put a band-aid on the situation and now we have to ask a, a band-aid on what, right? What's he trying to paint? Maybe the dissolution of their relationship. Um, this could be uh, him painting up the um, economic uh, failure uh, that this uh, business venture uh, has become his life in general. He's just trying to put a pretty uh, kind of coat on it. And this for Elizabeth is heartbreaking. And uh, it, it prevents her from telling him how she really feels, right? It's almost like he's trying, he's trying his hardest, right? He's trying to do something to repair the relationship, the business, their life in general, his character. But it's just paint and it's sad but it does stop her from saying anything to him, right? 
Therefore, maybe the hotel, we can say a lot about the hotel symbolically. Uh, it could represent their relationship, his life as a lure, right? If I am successful in this business, it will be this point of attraction for my wife and she will see the value in me and the worth in me. Isn't that sad? I know I'm saying that everything is sad right now, but it is. I mean, because I'm thinking about like real life and real people. It's like, I'm, thankfully, I don't, I don't have this problem, but some people feel as if, if I'm just successful in my career, if I'm just good at like my, you know, if I'm, I'm really good at my job and I, and I go far in my job, that that will help me get somebody in my life, whether it's a wife who's kind of falling away or, you know, I'm single and I'm trying to bring people in, you know, get, you know, find relationships. To think that it's all about your success in your job, um, it's kind of a sad thing, right? Focus on something else. Uh, something that's really going to lead to this kind of intimacy and this kind of passion, right? Um, moving on, she pities him. As I mentioned, she pities him and gives him the space he needs to try and prove his life in the relationship. So she gives him that. Now, you could say that's a bad decision. It's a good decision, right? It's a bad decision because she's not happy. So why give him more time and more you know, opportunity to try to fix a relationship that's probably never going to be fixed? It's a good thing, on the other hand, because she's giving him that opportunity. So you can really go both ways with that, right? She reveals to Dr. Reefy, uh, uh, can I just start calling him God? I'll just start calling him God. Uh, she reveals to God that she wanted to escape out of town. Um, she wants to get away from town. She wants to escape her clothes. She wants to escape her marriage. She wants to escape her body. All of these act as restrictions to her, her life, and we have to be able to explain each one. She wants to get out of this town. Remember back to Sherwood Anderson in the commentary he provides. Towns and cities can be very suffocating locales. They suffocate the individuality out of you, right? They suffocate the passion and life out of you. Uh, so I think we get that one. She wants to escape out of her clothes. That could be getting back to youth and passion and adventure, especially in the sexual sense. It also might have to do with the role of being a woman, right? There's obviously, in this day and age, a very clear woman clothing and a, and a very clear male clothing, right? And maybe she wants to break these boundaries of being a woman and, and, and you know, this kind of repression as far as being a woman is concerned. We all get the next one. She wants to get out of her marriage and she wants to get out of her body. And I think that last one we can start to connect to death. She wants to leave this place. She wants to leave Earth because her life is not fun anymore. Uh, and I'm being very general. Her life is not the kind of passionate uh, sense of adventure that perhaps you could argue everybody should be entitled to. She wants to leave this body. It goes back to like Dr. Reefy where he wants to dispose. He has this problem of disposing of his hands uh, and his... Um, whatever else was mentioned there. Get rid of the body and enter into the kind of spiritual realm, right? Maybe she's ready for that, but we'll talk more about that later on. Moving on, um, all of these have essentially led to a spiritual depletion for her. The town, the clothes, the marriage, her body. It has now just spiritually depleted her. Moving on, page 140. This is where the God symbolism, you just gotta keep going with it and make sense of it. It gets a little icky, but if you look at it figuratively, you'll start to analyze it properly. Reefy, Dr. Reefy kisses her passionately. And literally, we understand that she's on the verge of an affair here, in the literal sense. But in the figurative sense, God has taken this woman and has essentially, through this passionate kiss, breathed new life into her, right? Um, so I think we have to look at it more figuratively, right? It is only God. Remember, if, if you're not getting the love here, 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 you're going to have to get it from God in the sense of the story. And she gets this passionate kiss from God. And God is passionate, right? That kind of goes along with the demeanor uh, and the characteristics uh, of God here. He recognizes the miracle. And now we're getting language here, miracle, that obviously translates to an understanding of God, right? So you always got to be on the lookout for diction, the precise 
word use uh, of the author that will make these connections for you. Dr. Reefy recognizes the, pa the miracle of her returning youth and vibrancy. It's all happening here with God. And then it's mentioned on page 140, he will not see her until after her death. Just like God will not see you until after your death, right? Uh, again, within the context of this story. Uh, so I love it when they drop little, when Anderson drops little clues in the language uh, like that, because it really helps. Dr. Reefy, God, he won't see her until she is dead, right? At the top of the stairs, maybe back in the office. Uh, their relationship, which li literally would have been adultery for her, when we take this in the literal sense, if it would have gone a little bit further. We know it was just a kiss, but who knows what that could have led to in the literal sense. This moment, this kiss is broken up. It's put to a quick stop by an empty box thrown onto the rubbish heap. So there's a worker from downstairs. He comes up, you can, he's got heavy footsteps coming up the steps. And then you can hear he's got this box and he throws it onto the rubbish heap and through the door they hear this and it stops them from what they're doing. Now, what does that box represent that is thrown on the useless heap? That's a tough question, right? Maybe the relationship with the husband. Maybe it's, you know, the impossibility of a relationship like this for her that we would just, it's useless. We just throw it away. I'll leave that up to you, right? And thus, but, but one thing is clear. And thus the youthful passion dies in her and on her way home she has an unapologetic lust and that is referred that is given to us through the language there's blood still singing in her body right there is a real passion and lust and hunger for life inside of her because of this kiss from God or this kiss from Rifi moving on why does she hunger for death it's mentioned that she hungers for death. Why does she hunger for death? Let me at least kind of give you some response here. Because death will be life for her as she will be reunited with God, which for her now is the, su the source of adventure and youth and passion, which is all but absent from her life. So I think, and there's more evidence of this later, how do you approach death? Well, that all depends on what your life is like. For some people, life is miserable. It is not satisfying. It, it, there's nothing um, hopeful about it. So the biggest hope on the horizon is death, especially if you feel that there is something better beyond, right? So I think, how do we perceive death? It's all about the context of your life, right? Um, and for her, life is not fulfilling, and therefore death must be something better. Death could be incredibly better, uh, especially if we think about these experiences with God and Dr. Uh, Reefy here, okay? For her, which indicates, so if, if, if death is life, right, the irony here, if death is life for her, that means life currently is death, and that's a very sad thing uh, for her. Moving on. It's some more irony here. It's mentioned that she needs to stay young and patient and beautiful for death. Entirely the opposite of how we may greet death, except for perhaps the patients, right? Usually when we greet death, the whole idea, ideally, is that you will be old and ugly and kind of, you know, worn down. Here the idea is that she needs to be young and patient and beautiful in order to greet death, right? Uh, so it's very different for her. Uh, death is personified as youth running over hills and also a quiet, stern man marked and scarred by the business of living. And that kind of takes us back to, jo uh, I'm sorry, um, her husband, right? Tom. Her husband, Tom. That's a nice quote, the business of living, right? Living should not be a business, but when it is, uh, that's what leads to uh, the kind of attitudes we have from her father and also Tom, right? Taking away from the passions of our life, the business of living. If life has essentially degenerated into a business, um, then 
it's a very difficult situation for, for people to deal with. Page 141. Only thing she regrets is not giving the boy the $800. So we know that she's very close to dying here. She's even um, said to have an illness. They don't say what illness. But the only thing that she regrets is that she didn't tell George, her son, where the $800 was. And we know that that $800 represents a possibility of some kind, right? That you can get away, that you can escape from all of this. And almost quite coincidentally, perhaps ironically, she dies exactly at the age of adulthood for her son. So she dies right when this kid turns 18, which of course we know is adulthood, right? And with adulthood comes this idea that you better have your philosophy in, uh, on life in some kind of order or you might be headed in a pretty disastrous direction, right? So it's an interesting age for his mother to pass away. Um, Elizabeth needs to say something to him, but she can't. We know that she goes into a coma, a kind of partial coma, on the last, I think it's like six or something days of her life, so she can't say anything to him. However, it's mentioned, and again, quite touching, quite beautiful, um, that you can see the appeals on her face to her son, which shows how much she really wants to speak to him, and how much she loves him, and how much she desires to, to, to talk to him, and give him some, of, uh, some message. So it's very touching, and it says, like, anybody who saw her on her deathbed could see the earnestness on her face uh, as she really wanted to say something to her son here. What do you think she wants to say? Here's another question for you. What do you think he, that she wants to say to her son? What is it? Aside from the $800, what is it that she really wants to say to him and why? Some good symbolism here. It's mentioned that Tom colors his mustache with dye. Notice that that's very, very similar to painting the house. And he's covering his mustache, and you've got to ask yourself uh, really quickly, why do men color their hair? Why do women color their hair? But let's, let's stick with men, because that's what's being mentioned here. Why do men color their hair or their mustaches? To retain some virility of their masculine identities, right? Uh, or some sense of youthfulness, right? But notice that if you've got to cover it up, it's fake. It's a facade, right? Just like the paint on the hotel, you're not really fixing the core issues here uh, or the problems that lie underneath. Same thing with his mustache here. So he colors his mustache with dye as if he is keeping something alive there and we have to define what he's keeping alive. But as he sees his wife in the genuine appeal that she has for her son, he sees it too. The whole town sees it, he sees it. The tears start to dissolve. The tears start to, or I should say, the tears start to trickle down into his mustache and then they kind of mix in with the dye and then the dye comes off and kind of sprays off in a fine mist. So it is the tears, it is the emotion, it is the sentimentality that finally is coming from Tom here as he looks at his wife and his wife's need to speak with their son and all of this is taking that dye away and we're left with this very vulnerable kind of gray color, right? It's dissolving that fakeness and that facade, that cover-up, it's dissolving it away. Now, let me give you one way of thinking about this. The mustache, the virility, not of masculinity, but it's the, vir the virility of the American dream. This ineffective determination to be successful and make some enterprise work. All this fails Tom, the hotel, the marriage, it all fails him. And here in this moment of vulnerability, spurred by the clearness of his wife's love and care for their son, it all starts to fade for him, right? Perhaps if we would have had more tears earlier on, this could have led to a stronger connection that he had with his wife. I'm not sure, but, but it all comes off here at the end. Dr. Reefy, God, or God, right, is by her deathbed. Again, you can see how Anderson is putting all of these little clues in place for us. When a person dies, who will be at the deathbed? God, right, ready to kind of transition them into the next life. So God, or Dr. Reefy, is by her deathbed and has this very awkward moment with George when George comes into the room. 
as the room is heavy with the presence of two self-conscious human beings. So there's this element of self-consciousness uh, that we have here. Um, and ironically, and we'd have to define it and describe it at least, explain it, it but ironically it may be the same self-consciousness. They're sharing the same self-consciousness about the passing uh, of this woman. On page 142, George decides he will leave Weinsberg. After the death of his mother, he will leave Weinsberg. He's angry, however it's strange. One of the only things he can think about even as his mom is dying here, or has just died, he's angry about not being with a girl that he spent some time with. Now, the question is, does he have this urge to be with this girl out of normalcy, just like, well, I'm supposed to have a girlfriend and you know, there's this date I have, or is it real passion, right? Is a real sense of passion and adventure that urges him to be with this girl? It makes a big difference what it is, but we don't find out. Um, the irony is he wants life as, uh, as it surely is life, right? He wants life as it surely is life, and she wants death as it is surely life. I think George, and uh, the translation on George, just to give it to you, I don't know if it really plugs in too well here, but just to give it to you, if you look up George, it, it translates as tiller of the soil, or in other words, a farmer. And it's a good, I think, I think it's purposeful, not necessarily for this story, but it's ironic because he is a reporter, which is supposed to be something of a cosmopolitan, a kind of urban uh, uh, background, but we must return to the essence of simpleness uh, and, and looking at him as a worker, uh, somebody who is, who is purely a worker and has those simple sensibilities, right? which is what we're trying to get back in touch with here, of course. I think what might be happening at the end of this text with him wanting to be with this girl is the formality of his mother's death is preventing him from passionately being with another woman, right? That might be one way of looking at it. <clears throat> but he wants to live. Remember we mentioned this is a cautionary tale. There has to be a clear message uh, indirectly that is passing on to uh, George and it could be that life, you must chase the passion of life um, and hopefully you will not end up in the same dilemma as your mother here and of course this is why the money is important because that money is an opportunity to break from some dependency of some kind, especially for her as a woman, right? To break from some dependency. Her body in death is described as alive because it is now in death, of course. Now that she is dead, this is the youthfulness and passion and adventure that she's been looking for. She's She's back connected to it, so her body is described as alive and beautiful, right? Um, very different than she was described in life. You have an interesting um, refrain. Dear the dear, oh the lovely dear. George says this about his mother. Dear the dear, oh the lovely dear. He says this in reference to his mother. And these words, if you go back to page 137, these words match up to her anonymous lover's words that she recalls when in session with Dr. Reefy. When she's talking to Dr. Reefy uh, early on in the text and kind of having a session with him, she mentions one of her love affairs in that same language is uh, recalled by her. One of her lovers used that. In fact, it says the one lover, the one lover she could never get out of her mind, right? Um, and now George is saying those same words, right? So essentially, they share the same sentiment toward her. And this comes from an impulse outside of himself. It's like something he can't explain. But these words come from somewhere else but they're much needed, as we describe the mother here. The $800 uh, equals an intention to give George a start in the city. I don't know if that's a great thing. Maybe we do have to get out of Winesburg. It can be a very devastating place, especially for a young person. Uh, and, and I guess you have to get out and, 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 and experience the city, right? Something that, that's a bit more. But I think there's also some problematic issues with the city as well that are a part of some of the, the central themes of, of Anderson's work here. Lastly, we talk about where the money was hidden. And basically, when she got that money from her father, she held it for some time. And then early, when she was married to Tom, she 
knocked out a hole in the wall, stuffed the money in there, and then had somebody plaster it over. She kept it. She didn't give it to, to Tom. She could have given it to Tom for the upkeep of the hotel. But when you think about the symbolic uh, meaning of the hotel, whatever that's going to be for you, notice that she didn't want her money. She didn't want this one chance she had to go to upkeep or improve the hotel and perhaps the relationship right, that she had with this man. So she keeps it for safekeeping. She keeps it as an option, as this kind of guarantee that if she ever wants to, she can vamos, right? She can escape uh, if she wants to, right? She keeps the money as a backup plan, a guarantee of release. And the only other time she felt this release in life was with death and with Dr. Reefy, or in other words, God, almost as a preparation for her death, okay? There's a lot going on in this story. It's touching, it's heartbreaking, uh, and I'm sure uh, we could have some uh, more good conversations on it. This was a long lecture. This was the last lecture, and I'm glad we ended uh, on some fiction because that's really my bread and butter, my cup of tea, uh, my inspiration in the world. So thank you uh, so much, and have a really nice day.